Science. This is an amazing show where we get to talk to actual professionals in the field of science and learn more about them. Today's sponsors are the podcast, hashtag Saturday Morning Hustle. They uh, provided our lovely donuts this morning, so that was delicious. Thank you. Uh, and then also, our venue sponsor today is Project... 8110? No, that's not right. 3810! I've said it 80 times today and just forgot it because uh, I'm real great with numbers, hmm. uh, which is why I'm a scientist <laughs> and a mathematician. Just kidding, I'm a librarian. Anyway, so today we've got our wonderful guest, Lee Fithian. Welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> She's very excited to be here. Yes. Um, you know what? Why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself? First, thank you for inviting me. This is very exciting. I'm nervous, but very excited to be here. Um, I am an architect, mm -hmm. which I will explain for a in a minute what sciences and architecture are related. I also teach at the University of Oklahoma. Oh, that's awesome. And I teach architecture there. I do uh, research uh, in the science side of architecture, so I enjoy that. My background uh, is the typical go to college, don't know, uh, what I'm going to do, right. <laughs> five majors, took five years to get the first one, and uh, I started off not being artistic because my parents both went to art school and they were artists. And you know when you're younger you have to reject everything your parents do. <laughs> right, right. But then when you leave home and you get some, some distance and perspective, you realize that maybe there's something there going on. And since I like science so much, I found a way to marry the two. And architecture is the perfect thing to do that. So I got architectural engineering. Uh, when I graduated the first time, there was a recession. And when there's a recession in architecture, there's a little bit of downturn in the economics. So I went on and get computer science, and then that's when I started working. Awesome. And then uh, I, I worked for a long time and then uh, transitioned uh, to teaching, but I still work, and uh, then added the research component that's associated really with That's really great. It. So how would you describe the place that you work, especially since it's architecture related? I'm sure there's something interesting. It's like a regular office, but we have labs too, which is the cool part, because we, uh, in the structural side, we like to break things. <laughs> right. um, you build it and then you break it, because that's how you figure out how it's going to uh, perform oh, in cool. real life. You find out how much weight it can carry, how much strength it takes to pull it apart part. Sometimes we're working with materials to see how much water, what the chemical reactions are. Sometimes we work on making new materials, like I have a graduate student who's building bricks out of mushrooms and, Ooh, and glass and stuff like that, so cool. it's kind of neat. Awesome. So um, what would you like people to know about your profession? Like maybe there's a common misconception about architects that you would like to overturn? Yeah, it used to be uh, in the old days, like back in the Greek days, that this master builder concept happened where you had to know about math and science and the materials and you had to have the artistic design credit to be able to not just build things but make them beautiful. Right. Right. We sort of, um, with the advent of uh, computers and this big explosion and what we can do uh, digitally, uh, we sort of, and air conditioning. <laughs> uh, oh, we, thank the <laughs> yes. air conditioning. We're in an air conditioned space too, with no daylight, which is the worst kind of space, but it's good for events and things. But um, uh, the misconception that's kind of cropped up in the last couple of decades is that we're just artists. Right. That we just draw pictures and somebody else makes everything work. Interesting. And with the advent of an understanding of the contribution that architecture makes in climate change, we know that we have to recapture that science because we have to know about the energy usage and the environmental impacts and we have to bring those all back to the table. Right. And the architect has to orchestrate all that. Well, so and that's so important because you've got buildings sometimes where like it's all glass and then it burns people on the street or whatever. And you're or like, melts oh. the cars, right. right? And then you have to find out, oh, maybe we should have science tested that before <laughs> we built it. Whoops. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Do you have any examples of like an interesting architecture fail that happened in recent times because of that sort of thing? Well, you just did the best one. You know? <laughs> uh, there's another one with Frank Geary in the Disney Center in Los Angeles, and he's got those great form.
forms and he's you know used computation to create this structural system and it's covered with titanium plates and what happened was it reflects the sun it's oh, covered yeah. with metal yeah. right and so there's this beautiful building it's got tarp draped on it because it was reflecting the glare off into the surrounding neighborhoods and offices and buildings and they couldn't function and they complained and right. they don't have a solution yet right wow yeah that's that's intense that yes <laughs> it's like He's the biggest guy in the world right now. And <laughs> well, I mean, for every you know success, uh, there's there's got to be a couple fails out there, and for every fails, there's some successes. So, what's something a modern building or a piece of architecture that's really helping maybe the planet or helping oh, yeah. uh, pro progress? There's a, a lot of people who are really focusing on that. Where we're, we're uh, actually generating more power than we use. We capture the water to use in the building instead of asking someone to provide it. Uh, we mimic what we've learned from biology and uh, all of these things are coming together so that the buildings contribute to the environment and help clean it up as opposed to you know just taking from it and, right. and using 60% of all the energy that we use. So uh, the Bullet Center in Seattle is a is a classic one. It's totally off-grid, captures its own rainwater, provides more power than, than it uses and then it also composts the wastewater oh, that's so, so that cool. it can be used um, within uh, and, and treated uh, to grow things elsewhere. Awesome, that yeah. is so neat. So what is uh, one of your accomplishments that you're super proud of in the field of architecture? Um, when I was uh, just designing, when I was working in, in practice, I was really proud of the fact that um, I was the director of sustainable design, so a lot of the projects that we did had a lot to do with uh, decreasing our environmental impact. That's so cool. Uh, from a design standpoint, the Commanded General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, that was my, my biggest project to date. Uh, my most, uh, one that makes me the happiest because I get to see it every day was when I was at OU as a project manager for the union. Okay. So I was really happy with that. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, my biggest thing is because I'm finishing my uh, PhD and my dissertation and I just got a patent for a system that goes on the outside side of the building that sucks up dirty air and shoots out clean air. Wow, that is so necessary. Yes, Especially it is. Especially in those smoggy cities. Yes. Like, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of tourism that has dropped in some of the major cities because of the smog. And it is. There's, Absolutely. I know that there's areas of the world where people walk around with face masks because they can't breathe. And right. uh, that's that's a really great accomplishment. So Thanks. Congratulations. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Of course, with any accomplishment, I'm sure you face some challenges. What are some challenges that you've had to face as an architect? I think a lot of the time uh, it's educating the client. Sometimes we have really great clients and they want to do everything together. I've been lucky enough to have some really good ones, but these ideas and the things that we have to do, even at the national level, when people are saying sustainable design, climate change, we have to bring these uh, designers and architects to the table and bring the science with it. Um, sometimes there's pushback that, oh. you know, I just need to get this out the door. Oh, that's going to cost too much. And uh, so instead of thinking about uh, the way that it can help they're more concerned about the money and the time frame than... Which is classic. We can't <clears throat> ignore that. I mean, right. you're not really an architect and somebody pays you <laughs> to do a job, and we have to work with the clients. So one of the things I kind of teach in my classes, which is the advantage of teaching and not just practicing, because when I teach 20 students a year, you know, they're going out and there's 20 and 20 and 20, is that there are lots of things that we can do that don't cost anymore. Right. And that they can just bring those to the table, clients happy, all the things get done and it's less environmental impact. That's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. So what's a typical day like for you? Uh, well, in the summer, <laughs> that's when we have to do our research, right? And I'm finishing the edits on my dissertation. I have a committee. They're all different. They all want different things. And they read my first pass and they said, we need this and this and this and this changed. I have some articles that I have to get out. Uh, during the school year, though, uh, we teach classes that are like lecture classes, and I teach the systems classes, which is the science ones. You know, that's another thing. You learn from your mistakes. That's the scientific method. You try something, right. it might fail, we make some changes, and we try it again. So that's important. actually the design process, right. too. You try a design, you look to see if it looks nice, is it working, is it going to fill everything? Maybe not, we've changed it, and we move forward. 
So I teach a lecture class that's associated with that, but we also have something called studios. Okay. Those are uh, three days a week, all afternoon. Students come in, they're hunched over their computers, they're on their desks. We have a building that we're going to design and we start from beginning to end or sometimes just look at some of the pieces, go out and talk with people, present these, stand up every week and talk about what our ideas are and create buildings and teach them how to do that. That is so cool. It's fun. So was there something in your childhood or in your young adult life that really um, brought you to the world of architecture? Was there a building that inspired you or a specific situation? There are some people who are born knowing they're going to be architects and I had no idea about <laughs> architecture. I knew a ton about art. I got dragged out every Saturday morning to go to the museums and go do that because my parents were that. And I said, I don't want to have anything to do with that, right? <laughs> but I loved building things. I liked having little science experiments and I liked having electronics and I thought that I would go into physics. Right. So when I came to college, I went into physics, and then when I did saw what that physics was, I was like, oh no, I don't relate to that particular scenario. Right. So I started hunting, I went through chemical engineering and electrical engineering. I did all my pre-med because I thought I'd be working with body parts oh, and wow. you know replacements and stuff, and that didn't do it. And then somehow, someway, I tripped on to architectural engineering, and I was going like, Oh, I remember <laughs> calling my parents. I was going like, did you know about architecture? Your aha moment. <laughs> it was a very big aha moment. They go, uh, yeah. And I said, well, OK. And then I think back on the times when I would be walking with my dad, and we would go into houses that are being constructed right. and just walk through and he was there to pick up leftover pieces that he could make art projects out of. Cool. But one of the things we did was, you know, well I think that's going to be a bathroom that looks like plumbing things or that looks like it's going to be a bedroom he because there's no started visualizing as started just through. as a talk, right. you know, when we were little and I had no idea it had any impact. And then when I went into architecture, my mom handed me this whole notebook of drawings that she had done. They were floor plans. Oh. I said, what? <laughs> you know, and she said, yeah, I'm always trying to optimize. She was basically, you know, a really smart person, but she had chosen to be, you know, a homemaker because that was her job and that was she, she was going to raise us. And she had all these optimized floor plans. She said, here, these are yours. Do something with them. <laughs> like, how can I make my home more efficient? Yes, exactly. Perfect. In fact, I used one of hers on one of my clients because it worked out that the clock closet was right there next to the laundry room on the other side of the wall yeah. and she had said I always wanted to have a chase where I could just or shoot to drop it from our house in the second floor into the bathroom We're going like we could have a little pass through there and the client was like that's a brilliant idea and I said thanks mom. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. That is so cool. So uh, do you have any people that inspire you in the world of architecture? I think Every day there's somebody that inspires me and it can be just a student who has a really good idea because that's the beauty of this sort of like crowdsourcing in a studio that 41 different students all have different ideas and go like, oh, I hadn't thought about that because it's never the same thing twice. They right. come up with great ideas. You might just be talking to a client and they go, well, I've been thinking about this a lot and I want to try this and you're going like, oh, that's brilliant. I've actually had clients that say, okay, we're done with you. I'm going to do the rest. And I'm like. Okay, so that's another thing. But in the field, like uh, Ben Hughes, she does the biomimicry. She's the one who's the first person to say, look at nature. Nature's had millions of years to develop the right. technique. They don't need high temperature physics. They don't need chemistry. They work with what's available to them and they contribute to the system and then take from the system and then when they're finished it goes back into the system. I think that that's very inspiring and I think that's actually inspiring for a lot of people. That is so cool. Yeah. So do you have any advice after having been in the field for a while for anyone who's aspiring to be an architect? Well, it's important to know that it's not easy. Um, we have three uh, separate things that you have to do to become an architect. You have to have an education that's related to architecture. In fact, most of the states require that it has to be an accredited, NAB accredited degree. So you have to have that degree. Then you have to have experience. 
you have to be working under an architect that's licensed and has been through the whole process and so that they can help guide you in a sort of apprenticeship system and it's broad based they have different areas that you have to contribute to everything from talking to clients to drawing buildings to going out on site making sure it's getting built right and then the last part is they test there's a big test kind of like uh, last week the attorney they have the bar exam right we have the licensing exam and you have to pass those and it's multi sections you so how many years does it take to get all the, uh, that? the usual our program at uh, OU is four and a half years to get but usually we ask for a half a year of internship okay. or uh, going overseas so that you can broaden your experience it takes while you're in school once you get past a certain point you can start taking the tests to do it or you can also start accruing experience because okay. so, our internship program uh, if it's in the right sequence and in the right time gives you uh, experience so that you can shorten that time so basically your degree plus three years okay awesome. that's about how long it takes and so through all of that um, what words of wisdom kept you going I actually um, got a lot of words of wisdom saying, you know, you have computers, you have this, don't do architecture, it doesn't pay, <laughs> it doesn't pay, don't do architecture. And uh, I, uh, the words that I would share that meant the most to me is you have to love it. It has right. to be like a calling. It's not going to, you can make significant money, but it's a very small percentage of the population right. that does that. So the hours and the input and, and the background that you have to have and the effort that you have to put into it, make sure you love it right. because you really are going to be investing so much of your time and your passion associated with it that if you don't really love it, you're going to be unhappy. Right. Perfect. And that's like any art field or any science field or yeah. really any field at all. Make right. sure that you love it. That's right. brilliant wisdom. So mm. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I do have one last question for you, okay. which is, uh, have you ever made a soap-powered boat? No. <laughs> Would you like to make a soap-powered boat yes. with me? Yes. I'm all very right. excited about all the right. soap-powered boat. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, I have never made one. Mm -hmm. uh, as usual, I do, not, uh, I do not know the science experiments. So let's see. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, so in order to make this experiment, we had to pre-plan a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made some little, little cardboard boats. Um, before the the show started and we've got these little straw things here we've got our instructions uh, if you want to start reading the instructions okay I think we've got to have little trays here do you want me to read tray. them too sure what do we need okay it says we need a foam tray all right like the kind meat comes in or a piece of non corrugated cardboard uh, a tray or bowl or a cookie sheet full of water. Okay, so we, we need, need to water. fill this up with water. Uh, well, I guess mine? I'll take. Yeah, go ahead. We've got soap here too. Oh, it's coming out the side. Oh. It'll get out faster then. <laughs> fill in our trays with water. Okay, definitely right. a slope there. Uh, and do I guess how full does it need to be? It doesn't say. It says full of water but since these are going to float on it I think we just need enough probably to float enough it. to make it float all right what's next what else do okay. we okay it says liquid dish soap a toothpick a toothpick well we've got a straw okay I we'll, hope that we'll helps improvise <laughs> all right so we're supposed to cut the cardboard into a boat a shape water. which we, which we pre did, did. and a good size seems to be about two inches long we're a little bit bigger but I think it'll work all oh, right. Okay, dip the toothpick into the liquid soap and use the toothpick to put soap onto the sides of the notch at the back of the boat. In the picture. Sides of the notch at the back of the boat. I think so it's in this little like triangle, triangle space. I think so. Okay, cool. Great. Um, and that's it. That's now you're all supposed we have to, to do? place the boat carefully on the surface of the Whoop. water and watch it scoot across for several seconds. You've made a soap powered boat. Oh. Wow. If we're going to try it again, you need to rinse the tray and remove any soap and do it all over. So let's <laughs> okay. do it right the first time. All right, all right, all right. Let's see. Oh, oh, bubbles. Yay. Bubbles! That's my favorite part. I like bubbles. Uh, it reminds me of Finding Nemo. I love that. Which is my favorite. Bubbles. We actually, I use that when I teach architecture. Finding Nemo? Yes. Uh, there's 
a, a sequence when you enter a building and you want them to be Oops. very overwhelmed and like, oh wow, this is really cool. You want that aha moment. That's Finding Nemo moment. When they go and they, in Australia, you know, when mm -hmm. they go and they see the Sydney Opera House oh, and it goes, right. ah, that's. That's so cool. Okay, I do it. I would love end. to see the Sydney Opera House. That's that's awesome. They do so much stuff with it inside and outside. They have like a yearly lighting thing where they project stuff onto the sides of it. Whoa, it's that's really cool. cool. What kind of things do they project on the side? Animals, art, all sorts of really pre-programmed stuff. I I would love to go see that. I I'm really I don't know if I put enough soap on here. I this don't is either. gonna be interesting. Okay. Let's see if it um, works. All right. And it just says, put the soap on, and then that's it. Carefully place the boat. Ready? I'm placing the boat. Are, are we going to race? I don't All right. know. Race? Right. Three, Set, two, two, one. Oh, there it goes. Oh, mine's going <gasps> sideways. Mine's going sideways. It works. Yours is two. Oh, that is so cool. Is there first. Oh, that's because mine's you listened. Won. You won. I won. You won. Yes. My boat is fatter. That's, that's because I stole yours, and you made another. <laughs> right? Uh, I didn't know that worked. That's, so, that's cool. so cool. Did you right, try well, this beforehand? I did not. Oh, I it's perfect. Not. I didn't know. Will it go again? Oh, it it go will go again! again. <laughs> it said Ooh. it wouldn't do it, but... You know what would be so cute is if you, like, decorated the boat, put a little, like, person on it, maybe, like, a little sail. Try not to sink it. <laughs> right? I won't make it too heavy. That is so, so cool. cool. Man, I'm going to play Why with Why does it work? I said, how does it work? It says... Oh, there's a little bubble. Huh, so is a surficant. That means it breaks down the surface tension of the water, and as the surface tension is broken up, it creates enough of a force to push the lightweight boat across the surface. Cool. Oh, oh mine's slowing down. Maybe the soap power is, is wearing out. That is very cool. That is so cool. Thank you for doing this experiment with Thanks me. Thanks for bringing that. That, that is awesome. awesome. Cool. Well, hey, you know, I asked you to bring a book that uh, is inspirational to you, so let's talk about that next. It's called The New Mathematics of Architecture. So uh, I guess math has changed in architecture over the years? It has. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, in the old days, all of architecture, and everybody knows this, uh, geology, I mean geometry, was related to the Greek. It was one of the basic things that you learned mm -hmm. when you were being educated growing That's up. Cool. And up through... Uh, until recently, I'd say like the 1950s and the advent of computers, that was still it. Right. Uh, because you're not going to be asking uh, too many architects to do too much math. You know, they're going to be doing and doing the aesthetic components and the math that's required for all the material science and things like that at the time because the science wasn't as well developed. Okay. Right? Science changed the math, okay? Right. So with the advent and adding computers to that mix, we can do a whole bunch of computations that's based upon mathematical models of scientific principles. And those mathematical models are being used everywhere in the whole world. Math now that's related to architecture takes advantage of that. And we model all the properties. This is why we've started getting those organic forms because we couldn't really analyze structurally how to keep them up. Right. If architects are, the reason why we're licensed is health, safety, and welfare. We have to protect the public. Absolutely. I mean, you take it for granted, but it's our job to get you out in a fire. It's our job to make sure the building stays up, right? So we couldn't really analyze that and be sure of ourselves. So the computers came in and we've been able to do this and we borrowed from some of the organic form, uh, forms in uh, the computer and car industries. So let's see if we can analyze those with the materials that we have to see if we could build something out of it. And that's where Frank Geary started in Zaha Hadid and they brought it all in. And now we're really pushing it because we're using the sort of biological models like Ben Hughes is talking about where we have like Murray's Law and the branching of trees and stuff right. and the way our uh, lungs are designed with the capillaries and blood vessels and things like that to bring them to make things more efficient for ducks instead of just going here to here with ducks right we branch them out like that is so like cool. that stuff so this this book is talking about what's happened since 1990 about how beautiful some of that arc that math and those models are and how architects are drawing inspiration from that that is so cool so 
Now with, um, I guess, the advent and the boom of technology, are we going to start seeing even more unique looking buildings? I think so, but you also have to understand that those unique looking buildings, you know, uh, we used to have everything very classical, and then we got into the modernist, and the modernist looked really, really good because, you know, all this classical ornament, we don't want to do it, and now we want these modern buildings. Well, now we're moving from the modern into all these iconic, and if everybody was iconic and organic, it looks, it won't be iconic, right. right? So I think that we're going to apply it not just to the way they look, but how they operate. Right, right? so the insides of the building. Insides, how the systems work, the air, the water, the power, those kinds of things are going to, the materials, making sure that the science that goes into maybe like a circular economy that once we get it and we've made it, we can reuse it, and reuse that is it, and so reuse cool. it. That is awesome. So, is there something specific from this book that just really inspired you whenever you read it or when you started using it? Um, it's very important for what architects do to be able to visually cool. can represent. Show the front here so everybody knows. Uh, represent what we're doing. If we didn't draw a picture of the building, nobody would want to build it, right? right? right. So we have what we represent from all of that, a line isn't just a line, it's a wall, it's got material properties, it's got all sorts of stuff. What really attracted me to this was uh, the pictures. Right. Uh, yes, there's all the math behind it and what these different architects are doing, but visualizing what that math can look like is inspiring in and of itself. That is so, so cool. So when I have students and they're going like, I got into architecture, not math. Right. This is the perfect book to show them what you can do with math. Right, that is so cool. Well, and like you said, the line is not just a line Correct. when you're looking at it. So that is so interesting to think about. You have to dissect the building mm -hmm. and you have to really look at all the, all the angles and everything that goes into every single part of it and how it all works together. It's like, <laughs> So interesting. That is so cool. Good. I, so cool. I think so. <laughs> so um, are there any other types, because obviously you're mentioning the science is so important, are there, since you're dealing with air and electricity and water and everything that goes into the building, how do you balance all of those sciences? Like how do you know what you need to learn or what you need to focus on? It's incredibly complicated and one of the analogies that I use for the students is that we're like the conductor of a symphony, okay? We have to know and we have in our head what that piece of music is supposed to sound like, but we don't necessarily have to be the best violinist. We don't have to be the best cellist. We don't have to be the best bassoon player, okay? We have to know all those things. And it is an ongoing process because materials change. We learn new math since the 90s. We learn new computer software programs that help us be more energy efficient. They're all sort of toolbox things. And how we conduct and bring those together takes a lifetime. In, in general, I told you it takes four years and then three years of experience and then, okay, you're an architect. <laughs> you're still scared, right, right? right? You start out and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You say I'm one, but you know, and you work on it. And they tend to say late 30s is about when you kind of understand how all the different parts go together. And there's a lot of players in the field that contribute to it. You know, when I say about the air and the water and the power, we've got electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, but the architects really need to talk to them to help them understand what we're bringing to the design. What are the passive components so that you know we all work together in an integrated fashion? That is so cool. So you're like a jack of all sciences. It is. <laughs> I love it. You learn something new all the time and you have to know so much. And even if it's just the building part, sometimes who you're designing for, teaching, right? An educational building is different than like an office building. Absolutely. Right? Uh, or a library and things like that. And so. a supermarket would be completely Absolutely. different than an office building. So you have to know enough about that to be able to design something for them. That is so cool. So do you have people that you talk to that are familiar with, uh, for example, if you're building a supermarket or a school, do you talk to like the school administrator or do you talk to teachers or who do you talk to to know what that building needs? Well, there are people who focus on education 
educational, so they have a lot of background associated with it, and there's a National Center for Environmental whatever and educational stuff. But in the end, we would talk to the teachers, and we would talk to the administrators, and we would make sure that we covered what their needs were so that the spaces worked together. So we have control, we have safety, we have uh, daylight. It's been proven that if you bring daylight into a classroom, the kids retain more information. That is so cool. That is so cool. I know, uh, I obviously, I work in a library, mm -hmm. and a lot of new libraries have windows upon windows upon windows, and so it's wonderful to let that light in right. and, and be able to have such a bright and inviting space. So that's really cool yeah. that that light also helps them retain the literacy that they're utilizing. And it's better for the environment, because if we have good daylight, I don't have to turn the lights on, I'm not using any power. That's so cool. That is so cool. So. Um, We've got a little bit of an audience here today. I wanted to reach out to them and see if they have any questions for Lee. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, no. Ooh, awesome. Yes. Yay. Uh, you said that both of your parents were artists, so you grew up in museums, and they would drag you every Saturday. Yes, I couldn't sleep in. <laughs> you couldn't sleep in. But how do you think that upbringing around art informed or influenced the way that you design? So how did you feel? I'm just repeating because I've got a mic on. <laughs> How did you feel about uh, your parents being artists and how did that inform you uh, later in life as an architect? Well, I was internally grateful when I decided to be an architect that I had that background, okay? Um, so parents take them out to the art schools, take them out to the museums, kicking and screaming, you don't <laughs> know what they're, go they're going to do. Um, but at the time when I was younger, like I said, you sort of kind of have to rebel against your parents, you know. So I was getting really tired of waking up every Saturday morning and going down to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you know, or going out to New York or going down. The first place I whistled was in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. I'm like, come on. Oh, oh wow. Right. I was like, <laughs> You have such a distinct memory of the first <laughs> yes, time you whistled. Because it was embarrassing, you know, the first time it came out and I'm waiting in the gallery waiting for my, you know, to show up and this big whistle comes out. And Anyway, I think it's been a profound influence. I think that it's been incredibly helpful in that I'm not learning so much. I had to learn to design, but I had such basic uh, stuff that I was able, it was, inside me and it just needed an application right. of stuff whereas some people are just learning how what's proportion and balance and the rules of thirds and stuff I kind of had color theory and all that because my dad would take me and take me to the impressionists and and show me how they use just color to create depth because he knew from a painting standpoint that reds and blues you know they have different looks to them. I know from a scientist that they have different wavelengths and so that when they hit the eye it comes at different times and so it helps to create that sense that of depth. That is so interesting. Yeah. So um, at the time I didn't appreciate it but now that I recognize that background it's profound and I am so grateful for it. That is so cool. Yeah. Did anybody else have any questions? I do. Awesome. Uh -oh. um, so when you're talking like when you think about architecture the first thing you always think of is like these big, unique projects, like these big works, like the Devon Tower or the Disney, um, the the, the Symphony Tears, Center in yeah, LA. Symphony Center or or like the Sydney Opera House, like you right. think of those in downtown urban areas and things. Um, what are some ways that that architecture now is being applied to more? suburban or rural areas? Um, that's a really great question. So how is uh, In addition to the other one was really good. Being uh, applied to suburban um, areas as opposed to the urban areas that we think of. Or the iconic structures. Or the iconic structures. One thing I didn't talk about because we were just getting introduced to the topic is architecture is all around us. It's everywhere. Architects are involved in almost all the buildings. Um, what we're trying to do though is create it so that it's a good environment for people and for the activities that's there. That's there. When we talk about suburban stuff, and we're trying to uh, join that with climate change and the impacts on the environment, we're trying to not have serial expansion of suburban. We're trying to do infill development so that people are walking. There's a health. Uh, relatedness. If we're not walking, we're not healthy enough. Right. So we don't want these big spread out where if you have to go get a cup of coffee or go to the grocery store that we have to drive too far. So we're involved in urban design all the time, trying to bring that uh, together with all the services and, and mass transit. We're involved in those. We're, we sit on city councils and things like that to try and bring that 
uh, to bear, uh, city streets even, trying to put up with what we call a form-based code. Architects are intimately involved because we're trying to make those facades inviting so that people want to be walking, right. so that they want to, and it helps with the economic development of the city and the people who live there so that they can um, continue to develop and, and bring them all together because cities are the nexus of all, most all economies and if you look at population trends, everybody's moving to the cities and out right. of the rural areas. So even on the day to day, certain things that happen uh, within the buildings, we try, uh, even if it's just uh, a simple building, uh, I worked on a hangar uh, once in Aviano Air Force Base, I still tried to bring daylight into that space and most of the time you just see lights and people working, but bring daylight into the space and reduce the energy usage of it and use materials that were locally found and stuff like that. Wow. So. Next time I play SimCity I'm going to consider oh, yeah. the architects. The There's little... rules in that actually <laughs> right? where you know you can't go too far out because they're not a water line and it'll burn down. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. that's so interesting, yeah. that is so cool. Awesome. Did we have any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for oh, yeah. coming out, Lee, Fithian, everyone. And this has been Yes Science. Oh, our little boats, they're a little cardboard they're and they're falling apart. Yeah, they said not cardboard. Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. <laughs> of course.